You are now listening to The Forefront Radio, where we discuss history, the Bible, the history of the Israelites, science, and other matters. Bring it out. The history of the Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, as it relates to the Bible. Who were you prior to slavery? Who were you prior to colonization? These answers and more can be seen and heard as you listen to The Forefront Radio. Thank you for tuning in to the Forefront Radio. I'm your host, Afia Levi Israel. Now, at this time, we're going to talk about something that is of vital importance to me. Um, right now, it is Black History Month, and we're going to talk about something that is very important to know. Because the more you know, you know, the more you grow, as the saying goes, right? So I just want to uh, thank all the watchers, all the subscribers, all the listeners to this podcast. The Forefront Radio was established in uh, 2020, and we wanted to talk about Black history from a different perspective. You know what I'm saying? So I'm happy for all of you that are listening and tuning into the show. This is our first recorded episode where we're live uh, doing a live presentation and everything. So I want to thank you for tuning in and watching. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Please share the content. If you're watching on Spotify, thank you so much for watching on Spotify. All right. So appreciate you all. So now we're going to uh, go ahead and share the screen and do a presentation. This presentation is going to be about the East African slave trade. Okay. This presentation is going to be about the East African slave trade. So now notice we're going to get into a history that is rarely, if at all, discussed. And I mean, literally, rarely at all discussed. Think about this. Why is it that the only amount of education that we have is during Black History Month? And during Black History Month, we only learn about the transatlantic slave trade. We learn about Rosa Parks. We learn about MLK. We learn about Malcolm X, maybe, you know, but we rarely, if at all, learn about the East African slave trade. That's right, the East African slave trade. This East African slave trade is when the Israelites were taken in the different regions of East Africa, Central Africa, uh, Asia, India. And we're gonna prove this now with both the Bible as well as secular sources of history, okay? So if you're watching this, please get a pen, get paper, you know what I'm saying? Really take the opportunity, really take the opportunity to write this information down, go back and verify every scriptural reference and book that we set up on this presentation. All right, so let's get into it. Bible prophecy. What is Bible prophecy or what is a prophecy in itself? A prophecy is a message that is claimed by a person to have been communicated to them by a deity. Okay. Such messages usually involve inspiration, interpretation of dreams, revelation of a divine will concerning the prophet's contemporary world and or preternatural knowledge of events to come in the future, okay? So in other words, a prophecy is only a prediction. So now what we're going to get into is the prophecy of Joel chapter 3 verse 1 through 6. So now it reads, for behold in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people 
and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So this is interesting to note here, folks, because it's saying that all nations were involved concerning the captivity of Judah. All nations were involved concerning my people, the heritage of Israel. Now, as we read this prophecy or prediction, right, we're going to make sure that we understand that this prophecy, this prediction was written years before it happened, okay? I, I, I want you to note that this prophecy happened years, okay? In the past, we call it history. The Bible calls it prophecy. So as we continue to read Joel chapter three, verse one through six, I want you to consider what is being stated while we read this prophecy. All right, let's read, read some more. Verse three, it says, and they have cast lot, lots, okay? They have cast lots for my people. What are lots? Casting lots, if you recall, casting lots is what they did during slavery. During slavery, they casted lots or they bid or they uh, had slave auctions where they were bidding on men, women, and children. Now let's read on. It says, and they have cast lots or bid or did a slave auction for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So now the Bible is going to do something interesting. It's going to identify not only the nations involved, what they did, and we're going to back that up today with secular sources and history to get us to have a greater understanding of what is a prophecy, okay? What is that prediction, okay? To prove that the Bible is a true book. Because a lot of times people separate the Bible and look at it just like a religious book. It's not just a religious book. It's a book on history. It's a book of prophecy and predictions. It's a book that gives vital information in these days so we can have a better understanding of the creator of all things. No other history book, and mark my words, no other history book or prophetic book compares to the Bible. None whatsoever. You can compare all the books that are out there, no book can so accurately depict different parties involved in this slave trade or captivity as we read in Joel 3 verse 1, right? And we're going to read this and you tell me who in the comment section, okay? You tell me who this applies to, okay? We're going to read this. Watch this. It says, yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. So the Most High God says, I'm going to return everything you did to my people back to you. Watch what they did. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold, have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. That is Joel chapter three, verse one through six. So who was sold to the Greeks? Who was sold to the Romans? Who was sold to the Europeans? And what parties were involved? We're going to get into that further on in just a moment. That was Bible prophecy. So now let's take a look at the parties that was involved. What nations had a part in the slave trade? What nations had a part in the slave trade. Let's take a look at this. The verse party involved, Tyre and Zidon. Tyre and Zidon were descendants of the indigenous Hamitic Nilotic tribes. 
Sidon is mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, verse 15, as the firstborn of Canaan, Sidon is used interchangeably, either as S-I-D-O-N or Z-I-D-O-N, okay? So now, uh, an example of this would be, if you notice when you read the Bible, you mention it mentions Zion, right? Zion is referring to Jerusalem, is usually spelled Z-I-O-N. But in other areas of the Bible, it's mentioned as Sion or Sion, S-I-O-N. So whenever you see the S and the Z, they're, they're sometimes used interchangeably. Now, where is Tyre? Tyre is a city. Tyre is a city in modern-day Lebanon. It is one of the oldest cities in the world, dating back over 4,000 years, during which it has been inhabited almost continuously. It was one of the most important and at that time the dominant city of Phoenicia, okay? And that's important to know. So that's the first party that was involved in the slave trade. So we're going to ask the question, what nations, like we read, had a part in the slave trade? So now let's take a look at this. Number two, Arab. The Arabs or Palestine or all the coasts of Palestine were mentioned in that reference that we made of the prediction found in the book of Joel. The prophet Joel spoke of this nation, Palestine, all the coasts of Palestine, as one of the representations of the slave trade. And that's what we're going to get and dive deep into in this discussion, okay? Now, the Arabs had their part in taking silver and gold out of our temples. In East Africa, a slave trade was well established before the Europeans arrived on the scene. It was driven by the sultanates of the Middle East. African slaves ended up as sailors in Persia. So now, for a moment, when you hear the term African, sometimes people are confused because they're thinking that's the Hamitic tribes. What we're going to prove today is that the quote unquote African slaves are Israelite slaves. The African slaves are the children of Israel that we literally just read in the Bible that were scattered. Okay, because remember the prophecy. The prophecy says that they have put in captivity or slavery Judah. They have put in captivity Jerusalem. They have put in captivity my people. And who is God's people? The children of Israel. So let's continue on. It says this. African slaves ended up as sailors in Persia, pearl divers in the Gulf soldiers in the Amani army, and workers on the salt pans of Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. Many people were domestic slaves working in rich households. Women were taken as sex slaves also. So this is important to note because we just read in, we literally just read in Joel, where it said that they took the men, they cast lots for the men, right? And they cast lots for the women, right? And they sold the girl for wine. So what does that mean? They were taking women and trading them for alcohol. They were having um, prom promiscuous activities and fornicative adulterous, adulterous acts against our women during slavery. The, the, the indigenous Hamitic tribes Tyree and Zidon were involved, and we're also going to find now that the Arabs were involved, and there's going to be a third party that we find out later on that is also involved. So continuing on, it says this, Arab traders began to settle among the Africans of the coast, resulting in the emergence of a people and culture known as Swahili, right? In the second half of the 18th century, the slave trade expanded and began more organized. There was also a huge demand for ivory. Now, these slaves were used as porters to carry that ivy, okay? 
So some mentions of the Arab involvement with the slave trade include the transatlantic slave trade that some of us are aware of during you know Black History Month. They get into that. They talk about it. Right. They, they talk about the triangular trade going from Africa to the Caribbean islands, going to the uh, the uh, Americas, you know, North, Central and South America, Canada, Alaska, uh, New Brunswick, New York, uh, Virginia. Uh, then the Caribbean islands are mentioned as well. You have Haiti, you have Jamaica, the Trinidad and Tobago, you have Central America with uh, Mexico and um, Panama, all these different areas are people were taken into slavery during the transatlantic slave trade, okay? So now looking at the Arabs now, they were involved in the trans-Saharan slave trade. This is not really talked about in school. We, we rarely get per, pertinent information pertaining to the Arab involvement in the slave trade, how the Arabs all across Africa, right, were involved with the trans-Saharan slave trade. So now we also know that the Arabs or Palestine or all the coast of Palestine, that's the United Emirates, those that have taken over Egypt and called themselves Egyptians. We know the original Egyptians were, were of dark skinned races, black people, you know, Hamitic tribes, you know, because you mentioned in the Bible that uh, Egypt was run by Ham's son called Mizraim. So those folks calling themselves quote unquote Egyptians. No, those are Ottoman Turks and Arabs that were there that took over during the time of Muhammad's expansion. Okay. So then we have the Indian Ocean slave trade. That's rarely discussed. We rarely hear of the Arab involvement of the Indian Ocean slave trade. Then you have the Barbary slave trade, slavery in places like Tunisia, slavery in places like Libya, slavery in places like the Sudan, slavery in places like Mauritania, and slavery in places like Ye Yemen, okay? So these are the Arabs. These were the second uh, major nation mentioned, the coast, all the coast of Palestine. These were the nations mentioned that we just read in the book of Joel that the prophecy, the prediction of what happened prior to it happening. Number three, the Grecians or the Greeks or the Romans or the Edomites or the uh, Europeans, right? This was the third party. This is the most well-known um, in regards to the various nations during the transatlantic slave trade, but we're going to touch a little bit on the Greeks as well, their forefathers, their ancestors, the, the ancestors of the Europeans, okay? Before they were called Europeans, they were called Romans. Before they were called Romans, they were called Greeks or Grecians. Before they were called Grecians, they were called the Edomites or Esau of the Bible, okay? When you look at the description of Esau, Edom in the Bible, Esau is described as red and hairy like a fur coat. The only uh, culture and ethnicities and races of men on the earth where the blood shows forth through their skin, you can literally look this up in a dictionary, a well-known dictionary or encyclopedia, that the uh, Caucasian races have their blood showing forth through their skin. So when you read about Esau or the Edomites, they are described as red, okay? For lack of a better term, in the South, they call them redneck, right? But they're not just red in the neck. When they go out in the sun, they're red. When they're angry, they're red. You know, these are just various, you know, um, complexion descriptions that are made in the Bible, that are written in the Bible, that we can use to uh, verify and identify which culture and which peoples were involved as the third party in this slave trade, okay? So now, what's not very well known amongst the people, especially in the Americas, is the Book of the Maccabees, okay? The Book of the Maccabees is in this book called 
the Apocrypha. And I'm going to show it to you on the screen if I can. The Apocrypha, right? Okay. So now, for those that are not familiar with the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha was taken out of the original 1611 Bible. During the 1700s, the Protestants, okay, read this information and realized that they wanted to take it out of the Bibles, okay? Most Bibles, King James now, have 66 books in them, right? But when you actually read and look up, like, for example, a Cambridge University King James Version Apocrypha Bible, you'll find that various books of the Bible are included. So many don't know that Alexander the Greek or Alexander the Great was actually mentioned in the Bible, in the book called the Maccabees. So we're going to look up the references of the Greeks, the Romans, Europeans, Edomites, same people. And we're going to look at the reference here of their involvement of slavery. So check this out. It says, and it happened after that Alexander, the son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chittim, had smitten Darius of the Persians and the Medes, that he reigned in his stead the first, the first over Greece. This is found in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 1. One Okay, so now why is this important? This is important because on occasion when you hear about the Greeks, right, a lot of uh, Eurocentric uh, historians always state that the Greeks were the dawn of civilization. Have you ever heard of that before? The Greeks were the dawn of history and culture and everything that has to do with all the things that are wonderful and grandiose, right? Have you heard that before? Yes, I've had. This is the Eurocentric whitewashing of history, okay? Because when you actually read the biblical references of how the Greeks or Romans um, came into power, it wasn't a good thing. It, it, it literally, it was not a good thing at all, <laughs> at all. It was not a good thing. So we're going to look at the reference here in 1 Maccabees chapter 1 and verse 9, okay? Referring to the same situation with Alexander, the son of Philip, who's a Macedonian who became the first king over the Greeks. They call him Alexander the Greek. Watch this. Verse 7, it says, so Alexander reigned 12 years and then died. And his servants bear rule, every one in his place. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years. And evils, watch this, listen to what the Bible is saying. And evils were multiplied in the earth. So the Bible is saying that when the Grecians came into power, when Alexander the Greek came into power, it wasn't a great thing. It wasn't the dawn of civilization. Evils were multiplied on the earth. So now we're going to look at this reference here of what evils transpired here in this area. Now watch this. It says in 1 Maccabees chapter 3, verse 41, right? It says, and the merchants of the country hearing the fame of them, took silver and gold. Silver and gold, hold up, wait. That sounds like what we just, what we just literally read in the book of Joel, right? That they take all the gold and precious things out of the temple, right? And let's continue to find out what they did. It says, and very much with servants and came into the camp to buy the children of Israel for slaves. Hold up, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're telling me that after Alexander conquered the Persians and the Medes, that he came into the camp of the Israelites and his people, the Grecians or the Greeks, sold the Israelites into slavery. They came and took the Israelites as slaves. 
this is a vital importance to know because when you read the uh when you read the new testament scriptures right when it refers to neither jew nor greek neither bond nor free wait wait a minute the the, the term bond means bondage the term bondage means slavery captivity so who is it talking about is it talking about literal greeks no it's talking about the children of israel that were sold for slaves this is a period of time known as hellenization okay this is a period of time known as hellenization this is rarely talked about in black history month right we don't know this information you are not black you are not hispanic you're literally the children of Israel that were sold for slaves. And then it describes the people involved. It says, and a power also of Syria. Where is Syria? Isn't Syria an Arab nation? And we just saw in the previous section that the Arabs had their part in the slave trade, right? Then it says, and of all the land of the Philistines. What does that sound like? All the coast of Palestine, the Palestinians, the Arabs, join themselves unto them. So now when we look at who are the Grecians and the Romans and the people involved in the slave trade, it is well documented and well known that these were the, the nations described as thus. The Edomites are the forefathers. They are the forefathers of the Romans and the Greeks, okay? And we're aware of the British involvement in the slave trade, Russia, Germany. It is well documented of the slave trade in the United States of America. And then France was involved with the slave trade and also colonialism. And then you have Spain, you have Belgium, you know, and you have Portugal, the Swedes, Netherlands, or the Dutch, Scotland, as well as Italy. So these descendants of the Romans, these descendants of the Greeks, Hellenized or assimilated or integrated, Black history, y'all, the Israelites into their culture, okay? The unique thing of the Grecian captivity and the European captivity was this. If you look at the Bible and the various captivities that happened to our ancestors, you read about how during the uh, slave trade of the Babylonians, they may have changed some of the names of the Israelites, but they still kept their culture. For example, Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar, right? Um, you have Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their names were changed to the commonly known Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, and some stupid preachers say a bad Negro, but literally they don't know. <laughs> it's literally talking about Negroes being the, the children of Israel, but they use that as a joke. They say Shadrach, Mejak, and a bad Negro. That's that's what they say. That's the joke. I don't get it, but yeah. So, <laughs> so we find the, the different nations that was involved during the time of biblical times, the Babylonians, the uh, Syrians, the uh, Medes and the Purge, Persians, right? They enslaved the Israelites, but the Israelites essentially kept their identity. Now, the different thing with the Greeks now and the Romans and the Europeans is that with their involvement with slavery, what they did was instead of just changing your names, right? You, you're not Kutsukente no more, you're, you're Toby, right? So instead of changing the names, they did much more. They changed not only the names of the people, but they also changed their identities. How did they do that? By integrating, by assimilating, by Hellenizing the Israelites and causing them now to be Greek citizens, Roman citizens, European citizens, American citizens. So there's nothing new under the sun. What happened in the past happens today. 
just in the same way that we don't know who we were prior to uh, slavery. And now people are arising and waking up and telling you, you're the lost tribes of Israel, according to the Bible. It's the same exact thing that Paul was doing during the time of the Bible when he was traveling to different regions over Asia Minor, over Africa, over Arabia, and teaching the lost tribes of Israel, you are not a Greek. You are not a Roman. That's why he said, neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond, bond you're, you're in bondage, you're in slavery, my Jew. You're in slavery, my Jew, neither bond nor free, neither rich nor poor, neither male or female. Because guess what? The Greeks and the Romans had male and female slaves. This is the part of the Bible, the Maccabees, that you have to read because it gives vital information about the Grecian captivity and their involvement with the slave trade. So now, we looked at the Grecians as the third party involved, okay? So when we identify what nations were involved in the slave trade, once again, to review, we know that Tyre and Zidon was involved. We know that the Arabs and all the coasts of Palestine was involved. And we also know now that the Grecians and the Edomites or Romans or the Europeans were involved in the slave trade, okay? Very vital to know, very important to know, okay? So now, going on with this presentation, what we're gonna do going into the East African slave trade, now we're gonna back up what we just read with a history book. We are going to read this book called The East African Slave Trade, okay? Now, the to just to give a little bit of background, okay? The East African slave trade was written by the uh, Charles River as editors, okay? The subtitle states this. The history and legacy of the Arab slave trade and the Indian Ocean slave trade. So we're gonna read a little bit, okay? And we're gonna cover some of these topics that are listed in this presentation, okay? So we're gonna go over some of these topics and we're gonna read pages three through four and pages nine through 11. Now, we're gonna to touch on the Zanj revolt or Zanj rebellion in Iraq. And uh, this happened around the ninth century, okay? We're going to uh, also get into the transatlantic slave trade that was started with the Portuguese in uh, 15th century, which peaked in the 18th century with the plantations from South America, the Caribbean islands, and the United States. We're going to touch on the East African slave trade and the Indian Ocean slave trade which is uh, far more complex as far as the information pertaining to it. And there are reports, just to let you know, that even Libyans to this day, right, who are really Israelites that just don't know who they are, Libyans were taken as slaves and the domestic workers as recent as 2017, okay? Recently as 2017, Okay, and that's of vital importance because people think that captivity, oppression, slavery, human trafficking is over, and it's not. We are under the delusion here in the Western countries that slavery is not still going on in some way, shape, or form. It is, it is, it is. And then we're going to touch on um, Livingston, uh, who was a prominent person who knew of the uh, slave trade in uh, uh, South and Central Africa. And I just noticed that new doesn't have a K. So I apologize for the typo of that. That's the uh, perfectionist in me, okay? So now let's go ahead and read page three. Page three of this introduction of the East African slave trade, okay? It says this, quote, it is certain that large numbers of slaves were exported from East Africa. The best evidence for this is the magnitude of the Zanj revolt in Iraq in the ninth century. 
though not all the slaves involved were Zanj, there is little evidence of what part of Eastern Africa the Zanj came from, for the name is here evidently used in its general sense. Rather than to designate the particular stretch of the coast from about three degrees north to five degrees south, to which the name was also applied. And this quote is from Gada Hasham Talhami. Uh, the Zanj Rebellion Reconsidered, the International Journal of African Historical Studies, 10, 3, pages 443 through 461, 19, the year 1977. Here's another quote on page three. It has often been said that the greatest invention of all time was the sail, which facilitated the internationalization of the globe and thus ushered in modern era. Columbus contact with the new world alongside with European maritime contact with the Far East transformed human history and in particular, the history of Africa. It was the sail that linked the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe, and thus it has also been the sail that facilitated the greatest involuntary human migration of all time. Now, that's a heavy statement, folks. That is a heavy statement. The sail, listen to what the author said, the sail was utilized as the mechanism for slavery. That is heavy because without this device, the slave trade could not have happened. Without this device, the slave trade could not have happened. So let's continue on with the book. Let's continue on with the book. This is page four. And it states this, the transatlantic slave trade was founded by the Portuguese in the 15th century. Okay, so we have that as a bullet point here. So read along if you can. The, uh, if you have the book, read along. If you um, like, just, you know, come on, listen in uh, on this book that we're reading the quotes from. Okay, so what we're doing, folks, is for those of you joining on, we are literally going into history and prophecy. We read a couple of Bible scriptures, and now what we're doing is we're reading documented history of the East African slave trade to verify what we read in the Bible, proving the Bible to be a true book, okay? So let's read this quote again. The transatlantic slave trade was founded by the Portuguese in the 15th century for the specific purpose of supplying the New World colonies with African slave labor. It was soon joined by all the major trading powers of Europe, and it reached its peak in the 18th century with the founding and development of plantation economies that ran from South America mainland through the Caribbean and into the southern states of the United States. Toward the end of the 18th century, it began to fall into decline, and by the beginning of the 19th century, various abolition movements heralded its eventual, eventual outlawing, okay? So basically, they're saying that towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning towards, towards the beginning of the 19th century, that's when they started to try to outlaw slavery in the Western areas, okay? In the Western regions, right? They call it the West. Continuing on with the quote. It was throughout its existence, however, a purely commercial phenomenon, supplying agricultural power to vast plantations on an industrial scale. Now, this is important, folks. This is very important to note. You know why? Because um, the reason why this is important to note is because there could be no global system without the mechanism of slavery. What we know of as capitalism today, what we know of as uh, the stock market, what we know of as the global trade system, you know, could not have been established without 
this global history of the transatlantic slave trade, meaning what? Excuse me, meaning what? Meaning the, the gold, the silver, the mining that was done by the slaves created riches and wealth for all these nations on the earth, okay? What else? You have the cotton production, that's your clothing industries, your facet industries that produce billions of dollars a year, right? You have your tobacco products, right? That are now used in tobacco companies where they get millions and billions of dollars, right? Many of these companies have roots back dating back to slavery, right? So the point is, there could be no world trade without the beginning mechanisms of slavery, okay? So without slavery, none of these Arab nations, none of these European nations, none of these Chinese nations, none of these Indian nations would be in power at all if they did not use our people during slavery, okay? So continuing on with this book, let's continue reading, all right? It says this. It says, in every respect, it was unaffected and uninfluenced by history, sentimentality, tradition, or common law. Slaves transported across the Atlantic Ocean remained a commodity with a codified value, like a horse or a steam engine, existing often within a uh, equation of obsolescence and replacement that was cheaper than nurturing and maintenance. So in other words, they were saying it was cheaper for them to get rid of Black folks instead of uh, like a horse or like a cow or like any other common animal, um, as opposed to them trying to help and, 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 and assist them. And this um, kind of subtly, this quote subtly touches on the cruelty of what transpired during the slave trade, okay? So it was so bad, the slavery that transpired and the amount of atrocities that happened was so bad that there was extensive revolts that um, happened. And we're going to touch on some of the revolts that occurred later on. Um, we mentioned briefly the Zanj revolt, but we're going to go ahead and get into a little bit deeper information pertaining to that later on in the presentation, okay? So now the next portion is the East African slave trade and the uh, Indian Ocean slave trade, which is far more complex, okay? Let's touch on that briefly. The East African slave trade, on the other hand, or the Indian Ocean slave trade, as it was also known, was a far more complex and nuanced phenomenon, far older, sig significantly more widespread, rooted in ancient traditions and governed by rules very different to those in the Western Hemisphere. It is also referred to as the Arab slave trade, the Arab slave trade. Although this specifically might perhaps be more accurately applied to more ancient variation or variant of organized African slavery affecting North Africa and undertaking prior to the advent of Islam, and certainly prior to the spread of the institution south as far as the southeastern coast of Africa, right? It also involved the slavery of non-African races and was therefore more general in scope. All right, so we touched briefly on the uh, Zanj Revolt, the transatlantic slave trade, the East African slave trade. And here's another quote that we're gonna read briefly. The East African slave trade, the history and legacy of the Arab slave trade and the Indian Ocean slave trade examines the turbulent history of slavery across Africa and the consequences it has had. Along with pictures of important people, places, and events, you will learn about the East African slave trade like never before. So that was page four of the East African slave trade, okay? That was page four. Now we're going to jump across to page nine through 11. We're going to jump across through page nine and 11, and I'm going to read a couple of uh, insight towards a uh, European man by the name of Livingston, okay? So in page nine of the book, The East African Slave Trade by Charles River Editors, if you want the reference, it states this. 
Livingston was a humanitarian, and through his travels, he bore consistent witness to the unfolding horror of the slave trade in South and Central Africa. And he labored unceasingly toward its eradic eradication. As he probed incrementally northward through modern day Botswana, he eventually arrived in the region of Zambezi River that is concurrent broadly with the confluence of the modern borders of Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, and Namibia. Here, he began to encounter the first direct evidence of slave activity, originating from the Portuguese territory of West Africa, later to become Angola. This was to supply rogue Portuguese traders at the coast under a tolerant metropo metropo I'm sorry, metropolitan regime, and it involved a handful of powerful local tribes in various parts of the hinterland in the acquisition and sale of slaves. Now, this is important to note, folks, because we're going to get into some of what this individual by the name of Livingston experienced while he was there, okay? We're going to get into the history in this book of what this individual by the name of Livingston experienced and saw while he was there. So let's go ahead and continue with the quote of this book. Continuing on, on East African Slave Trade, page uh, nine, it states this. Observing this, Livingston began to consider a solution, and in due course, he came up with what he called Christianity and commerce. By the mid-1850s, at the time that this was taking place, the trade in slaves by European trading nations had generally been outlawed, and a British naval blockade sought to enforce this ban in the Atlantic and along much of the West African coast. Portuguese slave traders, however, these are like raiders, these are like uh, uh, pirates, you know, and different people of uh, Portuguese descent. Portuguese, <clears throat> excuse me. Give me a second, just drinking some water. I'm gonna cut that out though. All right. It says this, Portuguese slave traders, however, kept up an illicit trade in all, <coughs> excuse me, Portuguese slave traders, however, kept up an illicit trade in all its African territories, and the uh, practical efforts of this were what Livingston encountered when he reached the Zambezi. He contacted local leaders and urged them to desist and embrace Christianity. But while he preached his words, in the end, had very insignificant, if any, effect at all. So now, I want to pause for a second there to uh, touch on briefly this idea of how, uh, how can I, how can I say this politely, how during that time, the, <coughs> excuse me. During that time, the uh, Europeans wanted to um, moralize the Israelites. They, want to, they wanted to end those that they called, quote unquote, Judaizers, Ju Judaizers right? They, um, during the 1400s or the 15th century, the Pope, it is, it is well documented that the Pope set up papal bulls or laws to enslave the Jews, okay? This well, well documented history. Go back and look up some of the papal bulls on slavery and you will find out that this is a fact, that they were the ones, that the Popes were the ones that instituted forced conversion during the time of the Inquisition, because remember, keep in mind, the 15th century, 
you know, the 14th and 15th centuries and going forward was a time during the, the Inquisition where they were forcing people to convert to modern Christianity, okay? Modern Catholicism, okay? Worshiping of the, uh, instead of the uh, black images of Jesus Christ and of the saints and of Mary, you had Caucasian or Renaissance images of these individuals. This is very important to note. So while we're reading in this book of the East African slave trade, what I noticed is that this person by the name of Livingston had this concept of Christianity and commerce, okay? So we're going to read on in this uh, section to uh, get more detail about this. It says this, the essence of his concept of Christianity and commerce, however, was quite simple. The introduction of Anglo-Saxon Christian values. You see, this is Hellenization again. This is assimilation again. This is integration again, right? Let's read it again. The essence of his concept of Christianity and commerce, however, was quite simple. The introduction of Anglo-Saxon Christian values would instill in quote unquote pagan race the simple virtues of humanity and humility, while commerce was introduced alternatively as avenues for powerful and wealthy local leaders to acquire and retain wealth other than that through the capture and sale of slaves. Central to this strategy would, of course, be a viable highway into the interior. When Livingston finally arrived on the south bank of the great Zambezi River, he felt certain that this was precisely what he had found. So we're reading about Livingston and how he uh, knew about the uh, slave trade going on in South and Central Africa. So we're going to read other quotes. We're now on page 10 of the book, East African Slave Trade, and I'm going to read a couple of quotes from there. It says this, by the end of the growth of the European imperialism that had begun uh, spreading to touch every continent of the world, although not yet to quite the same degree in Africa, European spheres of influence existed at various points along the coast of Africa mainly as a residue of the Atlantic slave trade, but no comprehensive effort so far had been made at European colonial, uh, coloni colonization. The interior of the continent remained very much terra incognita, isolated by challenging geography, tropical disease, and the perception that Africa had little other than its own people to offer. And upon the abolition of slavery and the end of the trade, the attention of the European capital element began to drift elsewhere. Africa, apart from the long-held colonies and republics of the uh, extreme South, was left to missionaries and explorers. Here's another quote. Livingston was among the first to attempt a de definition of imperialism as moral, under and by an obligation on the part of the civilized, quote unquote, civilized races to nurture, protect, and uplift the quote unquote savage, and as a God given mission to advance and civilize the pagan reaches of the world. So think about this. This right here is literally Hellenization. This right here is literally. <laughs> <laughs> this right here is literally Hellenization. This is uh, European saying that we got to save the savages, right? <laughs> Which is funny to me because those savages already knew about the Bible. If you look into Ethiopia, they have images of Black Jesus, Black God, Black angels, Black saints, Black Christ. I wish I put it in this presentation but I didn't get an opportunity to do so. I really wish I put it in this presentation, but I didn't. I, I have so much information in this presentation that it was too much just to put it in, okay? 
So we're literally reading in this book that Livingston, among his definition of imperialism, was to create it and try to moralize imperialism. <laughs> he tried to moralize forced conversion of Anglo-Saxon values to the Israelites and the indigenous populations of the continent of Africa. This is funny to me, folks. This is hilarious because we're seeing that the editors of this book are trying to deify or uh, what I call the process of heroification of European descendants or European ancestry that, uh, that get into trying to save or civilize the, the dark nations. But these nations were already aware of Judaism. They were already aware of Islam. They were already aware of Christianity. In the Ethiopian church to this day, they worship Christ. But little do we know that prior to Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Catholic church whitewashing or iconoclasm of these images of the saints of Jesus, we thought and we knew back then that these individuals were, were black-skinned people. We knew that. If you read, like, for example, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, it uh, mentions how Paul and Barnabas were going around, and one of them was called Niger or Nigger or Niger, right? You could read that in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And we have a place called Niger in Africa or nigger in Africa, which means black, which is just a derived word of Negro, which is Spanish for black. It's the same term. It's the same term. Okay. Whenever you say Negro, that's the Spanish word that means just black, but black is just the color in a crayon box. We are literally the Israelites of the Bible. That's who we are. So we read earlier in Joel and we're backing up now historical documentation of the slave trade. So now let's read the quote now in this book called East African Slave Trade on page 11, the Arab involvement now with the slave trade. And it states this. Since time immemorial, slavery also was, has been integral in Arab society. It has been integral in Arab society. Let me read this quote again. Hold up. Wait a minute. Since time immemorial, slavery has been integral in Arab society. Hmm. So you're telling me that the Arabs always had an involvement in slavery. Yes. In the previous episode, that we aired of, of the uh, East African slave trade part one, when we were getting into Bible verses talking about this subject, we proved based on Genesis that the uh, son of Abraham called Ishmael is where the Arabs de designed their ancestry from, okay? So we saw how the uh, Greeks are descendants of the biblical people known as Esau or Edom, and now we know for a fact that the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael, right? So during the time of Egypt, when, um, when, uh, when Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites or the Arabians, they were mentioned in the Bible as doing that way back then in the book of Genesis, right? And there's nothing new under the sun, but things written aforetime are written for our learning, right? That's Romans chapter 15, verse four. So we're reading this history book and it's literally telling you since time immemorial, since we could record documents of history, these Arabs were involved with slavery, slavery of the Israelites, slavery of our ancestors, slavery of the people of the book. Continuing on, it states this. And in some instances, it still is, right? So now the quote says, in some instances, the Arabs are still involved in slavery. Why is that important? Because we know of the fact that there are news reports, right, where Libyans, right, were taken as slaves as recent as 2017, at the time of this recording of this uh, uh, podcast, it's 2022, 
So for those of you that are in the future, please look into this information, go back and look up the news articles and the resources of the uh, uh, slave trade still going on. There's various news reports um, by, I believe, Al Jazeera, CNN, uh, about the slave trade still going on or human trafficking still going on in Libya. So now continuing on with this book, it states this, in cases where ancient Arabic ideals are under revision within, for example, the conventions of the West Africa Boko Haram movement or the Islamic state of Iraq and the Levant or ISIL or ISIS, what is described as chattel slavery or the direct ownership of one individual by another based generally on religious exclusivity survives under the terms of Islam. So what he's saying is that under Islam, slavery still exists. It still survives in a chattel slavery uh, domestic way. Thus, in, re in this regard, organized slavery in the Eastern Hemisphere vastly predates any similarly organized slavery in the West, and statistically, the East African and Arabic branches of slavery by far exceeded the number of slaves exported to the New World, although, of course, such numbers will by necessity always be speculative, right? Because we don't have all the documentation, the censuses, the, uh, you know, various records that, you know, they had various places and libraries were burnt in, you know, during different raids and historical wars that happened, okay? So that's why he says that that some of the numbers of the people involved and who and what and where are speculative. That's why he's saying that, right? So now, one question to Mark, continuing with the quote. One question mark in particular has, has long, however, over uh, East African statistics. And this was the wastage that occurred because of the rigorous methods and styles of capture and transportation and the preference often for castrated youth rather than viable males. So remember what we read in Joel, the children of Israel, right? They took the men and the women, but what was different about the uh, slave trade that happened in the East African slave trade was that these Arabs would castrate the men, okay? This is why their numbers declined because they weren't able to re reproduce more people, okay? And this was a tactic that they used all the way back since Babylonian times, okay? Whenever they enslaved the Israelites, they always castrated they all, even in America, they did that, okay? Whenever people were lynched or killed or whatever the case may be, there was an occasion for them to have a perverse nature of castrating the males. And this is no different than the Arabs, okay? So all of these nations, they have done the same thing throughout history, okay? So it says, for castrating youth rather than viable males, which resulted in a brutal death toll all of which in combination impacted East Africa perhaps more than West Africa during its period of greatest exploitation. What might be regarded as the East African slave trade began with the exploitation of the Bantu peoples settled in and acquired for slavery from the shores of Somali by Arab traders from Southern Arabia particularly from in and around Yemen. This, however, is nowadays something uh, uh, of a subtext of a later and much wider spread of the slave trading that took place along with what today is called the Swahili coast. So this was page three through four and pages nine through 11 of the East African slave trade book that we just read. Very important information to know. So that was secular sources, all right, pertaining to the Bible prophecy that we just read. So we're going to continue 
with this presentation going into the East African slave trade and the Arab slave trade and their involvement with what happened, okay? So in this uh, section, we're gonna go over pages 12 and pages 13, which touches on briefly the various areas of uh, what took place during slavery and the nations that were involved where they took our ancestors as slaves. So Kenya, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Somalia, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, these are some of the areas that were uh, where our ancestors were taken as slaves. Um, the Zanj uprising is also going to be mentioned as we read, read along, which took place between 869 to 883 CE or BC. If you uh, know, CE is common era and BC is before Christ, okay? Um, um, and uh, I'm sorry, that's probably, that's actually incorrect. There's BCE, which is before Christ, and then CE, which is actually AD. So that's an error. I apologize. Um, so this is 869 to 883 AD, which is the year of our Lord for those that use the old calendars. All right. So then the East African or Bantu slaves are going to be mentioned in this book were large numbers of, of uh, Arabia and Persian Gulf. And then the slave markets that were supplied uh, through Yemen with the enslavement going from the Ethiopian highlands and the southern uh, Sudan. And then later on, we're going to mention the scriptural prophecy references of our ancestors being involved in Ethiopia, Sudan, you know, and all these regions uh, found in the biblical prophecies of the prophet Isaiah, of Isaiah 11 and 11, the prophet Zephaniah, um, in Zephaniah 3, verse 1 through 13, and the Acts of our Ancient Ancestors, the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 5 through uh, 13. So we're going to get into it briefly, okay? So we're going to get into it as quickly as possible. All right, continuing on with this book, East African Slave Trade, page 12, and it says thus, this region stretches from the southern coast of Somalia to the northern coast of modern Mozambique, encompassing the islands of the Lamu, Pemba, and Zanzibar, including the adjacent interior. The scope of the Swahili language, as it is spoken today, as a common uh, medium of communication, stretches across the entirety of Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and much of the Eastern Congo, touching the northern and southern coast, respectively, of Mozambique and Somalia. This attests to the scope of Swahili trade in the interior, the extent to which that um, it influenced cultural development and the extended uh, period during which it flourished. So this is of vital importance to know, and I hope that um, folks are paying attention to this information and really getting a deeper understanding of what's literally going on with our ancestors in the East African slave trade. Going on to page 13, it says thus, the character of slavery in the region and slavery at, uh, was the second major cornerstone of coastal trade and always closely intertwined with the much more important ivory trade was twofold. Initially, and very generally speaking, slaves were purchased or captured in the interior by coastal traders for the uh, primary purpose of portaging ivory and other goods from the interior to the coast, and only after thereafter repurposed as an ancillary product for onward sale. Despite this, the trade was very lucrative, and it was widespread, and from about 9th century onward, significant numbers of indigenous Africans were finding their way to the mainland of Arabia and the Persian Gulf. One of the first uh, textual records of this was in contemporary reports of the Zanj Rebellion. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Zanj Rebellion, the Zanj Rebellion is the country of the Blacks of Southeast Africa, okay? 
They had a slave uprising that took place between 869 and 883 CE. The word Zanj was a general umbrella term used by Arabs in to define the Black, African, or Bantu races of Africa that comprise by far the greatest number of slaves present in Arabia. So this is important to know because when you look up the word Anj or Zanj in Creole or French, that word means the angels, okay? We were referred, the Israelites were referred to as the angels or messengers of God. The word angel means messenger, okay? So when you read in the Bible, you have various terms that are used. For example, when King David was speaking, he referred to uh, uh, someone as, oh, you are as an uh, angel of the Lord. You're a messenger of the Lord. You, you brought such a blessing to me. Okay, so the term zanj I find interesting because that word zanj or ange in Creole is a word in French that literally means angels. Okay, so it's interesting that these blacks uh, were called zanj or ange. Okay, so reading on, it says the zanj rebellion was a, a ostensibly a slave uprising, but it also included many Black freemen. So a lot of times people don't understand that during slavery, our people was still going to war. They was trying to get out of captivity. They weren't just taking it. They weren't just turning the other cheek. Like people uh, try to try to play like we're soft and docile. This was literally an uprising. This uprising is rarely talked about, okay? rarely if if at all talked about one of the greatest uprisings to ever occur in the eastern hemisphere the zanj rebellion was ostensibly a slave uprising which included many black freemen and it began not far from the present day cities of basra and modern iraq this was the center of agricultural economy that at the time absorbed large number of African slaves. And the rebellion is recorded as being one of the bloodiest and most brutal in Western Asian history, which lends in some perspective, it does, however, also serve to date the point at which the East African Bantu slaves began to appear in significant numbers in the quarter of Arabia and the Persian Gulf. So this is important information to note, folks. Most of the slaves, however, uh, probably originated in the Horn of Africa and not so much in the uh, Eastern African regions. And this is supported by a comprehensive series of historical records documented the uh, movement of sale of slaves out of this region. The port town of Zela, for example, situated on the uh, north coast of modern Somaliland, was a major regional trading entrepot and it was home to the Ethiopian highlands and southern uh, regions of Sudan between the 10th and 16th centuries. The presence of the Zanj slaves was increasingly documented across the uh, more westerly reaches of Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf, with the smaller numbers appearing in India and China. So think about it. Our people were taken as slaves as far as China. When you read about, like, for example, when you watch the movie, uh, the TV show on Netflix about the Kun Lun, right? That that uh, white dude that's that's uh, going around as a Kun Lun uh, warrior. That's literally talking about the Kun Lun slaves. The Kun Lun slaves were black people that were taken as slaves all the way as far out as China. And we're reading this in this book how small pockets of our people were taken into India and China. And you can go back and look up this information. Some of these people are re referred to in India as CD or the untouchables um, and um, other uh, nations of Afro-Indian people um, or Afro-Palestinian people or Afro-Chinese people that were taken into slavery. These are the Zanj or the Anj or the angels or the Israelites that the Bible speaks of. 
the origins of these slave populations must necessarily be obscure thanks to the general scope of the word zanj, but it can reasonably be uh, supposed that the majority uh, originated in the Horn of Africa and Southern Sudan with perhaps small numbers trading along South Swahili. So now let's look at the biblical reference because the Bible prophesied that we would be taken across uh, the rivers of Ethiopia and in other regions. So we're going to look at first at Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11 through, uh, we're going to touch on verse 10 through 13. It says this, it says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse, shall bring mine offering. So the daughter of my disperse is referring to the children of Israel, okay? So we're reading that the children of Israel were taken beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And where is Ethiopia, folks? For those that don't know, Ethiopia is in the continent of Africa. It isn't in Europe. It isn't in Poland. It isn't in Russia the continent of Africa. Let's also look at Isaiah 11.11, 11, which mentions the various regions that our people were taken in captivity. Isaiah 11, verse 11, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, who are his people, the Israelites, which shall be left from Assyria, that's the area we were taken in slavery, and from Egypt, that was the area that we were taken in slavery. And from Pathros, Pathros, if you don't know, is Persia. That's the area we were taken into slavery. And from Cush, for those that don't know, Cush was a Hamitic tribe that, of the Africans called Ethiopia now, or Babylon also, because the Babylonian uh, kingdom reigned all the way from Mesopotamia all the way to Ethiopia. And from Elam, Elam is the Indians, the so-called Indians. And from Shinar, Shinar is Babylon. And from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And shall set up a sign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, of Israel, of Israel. So the outcast or the diaspora was not Africans. The outcast was Israel, according to the Bible. We're literally reading the Bible and backing it up with the slave trade of history that we know of that is documented. And gather the, uh, it says, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So now let's go back to Zephaniah chapter three. So Zephaniah chapter three. And verse, let's see here, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse, shall bring mine offering. And that day shall thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee from those that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee a poor people. Remember the Bible says, blessed are the poor. So this is who was talking about. And they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found near their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So this is important information, folks, because the Bible documents the various regions that the children of Israel were taken into captivity. And this information that we're reading is of vital importance because there has been a European uh, iconoclastic system placed over the Bible and over history to give the disconnect, that divide and conquer mentality, which is why many people don't know that the Bible is actually a, a Black history book. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 5 through 13, and we're going to see what that says. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. 
Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. So why is it that during the time of Pentecost, these various Jews came and were speaking different languages? Why were they coming out of every nation to come down to Jerusalem to be on one accord in one place to celebrate a documented feast day of Pentecost in the Bible? This goes to show you that even after the time of Christ, the Israelites were still keeping the commandments of God. Our ancient ancestors were still keeping Passover, still keeping Pentecost, still keeping tabernacles, which is what we should do today. We should not celebrate Christmas, Easter. We should not go to uh, doing these various uh, 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 travels to Mecca for those of you Blacks that are involved in Islam. Those are not our traditions doing your hodge and all that stuff. Those were not our traditions. Our traditions were literally Pentecost, Passover, and things of that nature. But I digress. Let's continue reading. It says, verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying once unto another, Behold, are these not which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Part So this is talking about Jews, devout men out of every nation, that's going to describe now the areas in Acts chapter 2 where they were taken as slaves. Parthians, Medes, Elamites. So now let's mention where this is. Parthians, that's Persia. Medes, that's Medea. Elamites, that's India. Like we just read in the book, of the East African slave trade, India, slaves were taken as far as India, right? And dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and in Pontus and in Asia. Remember, we just read in the history book that slaves, these quote unquote Bantu slaves, were taken as far out as China and were reading out of the Bible Asia. Continuing on, it says Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. So this shows you that those people that are Arabians are Israelites that were taken into slavery in Arabia. Those Cretes are Israelites that were taken into slavery in Crete. Those are Grecian areas. Those Greeks, those Greek speaking Jews, where it says in the New Testament, neither bond nor free, rich nor poor, you know, all of that that we mentioned earlier. So this is vital information, folks. This is great to me. This is wonderful information. Remember, the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So let's continue with the presentation. All right, next. Next, we're going to get into the Zanj Rebellion, okay? And we're going to go to we're going to go to Wikipedia, and touch briefly on the Zanj Rebellion in a little bit more detail, okay? Um, to get into what this information is and what this information is pertaining to, okay? So now let's look at this. Let's look at the uprisings that happened, the successful slave revolts that happened. We know of in the United States of America, the slave uprising that took place with Nat Turner. This uprising was when Nat Turner came and take many of the slaves. They literally called him the prophet because he read the Bible and he used the Bible as a tool for uprising, a tool for liberation. He read the Bible and read about Exodus and Revelation, where it talks about our freedom and redemption from captivity. So it is well known during Black History Month about Nat Turner and his uprising, but rarely do we know of the other slave trade that took place. Okay, so let's look at that. The next slave trade that we uh, may not be aware of 
um, is the slavery that happened in the island of Hispaniola or the area marked by two nations known as Haiti and Dominican Republic. The Haitian Revolution occurred during the late 1700s, early 1800s, and this was the first free Black nation that established itself away from slavery. They did not have an Emancipation Proclamation. They did not have uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. This was our ancestors literally getting it by the knuckle, by the sword, by burning down. Um, they had a, a phrase called Coupe tête boule kai, which means cut off the head and burn the house. That's how they got down. So the first free Black nation established in the Western Hemisphere. This is of vital importance to know. The reason why is because the the uh, United States of America, right, obtained this entire region known as the Louisiana Purchase. Right, we didn't know that because the slaves of the Haitian Revolution, right? Because the slaves of the Haitian Revolution won and defeated Napoleon and the French, that is how the United States of America was able to obtain the Louisiana Purchase and gain all this land all the way from the Louisiana territories, all the way across to the region that we know of as California, going up to Washington and all this region. So now, that touches on what we know of in the Western Hemisphere. But what we don't know of is the Eastern Hemisphere in the continent of Africa and in the areas of Arabia and Iraq, the Zanj Rebellion. We touched on it briefly, but let's touch on it, um, what's seen in the historical area of Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, it mentions the Zanj Dynasty. And Zanj is uh, uh, in our Arabic, is pronounced as Zanji, Romanized Zangi. Turkish Zenchi was a uh, name used by medieval Muslim geographers to refer to both a certain portion of Southeast Africa and primarily the Swahili coast and its inhabitants that were of Bantu origins, right? But we know Bantu was really the children of Israel, right? So now going down to the etymology, Zanj is an Arabic, Arabic term that they quote unquote say means country of blacks but we uh, just saw that zanj also can mean angels or anj in french right other transliterations include zenj by the chinese or zang you'll hear about this uh going on uh zang or zengi by the uh, javanese right who mentioned the quote-unquote african people and precisely the people uh from zanzibar it is known that the uh, Indonesian Austronesian peoples also reached Madagascar near uh, between 50 to 500 CE. This is, in, this is important information to know because a lot of times we don't know about the East African slave trade and the Zanj Rebellion. So this is good statistical information that we can look up on Google and on Wikipedia. Next, we see the uh, division of the uh, east, eastern side of Africa done by the Arabs and the Chinese. Arab and Chinese sources referred to the general area that was located to the south of Mizr or Mizraim or Egypt, um, Al Habasha or Abyssina or, e or Ethiopia, and Barbara, right? Uh, which is known as Somalia as Zanj. So the Chinese and the Arabs referred to all these peoples as Zanj, okay? So that was, oh, let's touch on the, uh, the, uh, the information pertaining to the Zanj Rebellion now. The Zanj Rebellion was a series of uprisings that took place between 869 and 883 AD near the city of Basra in uh, present-day Iraq. Many uh, uh, Zanj were taken as slaves and were often used for strenuous agricultural work, okay? And the reference to that is Islam from Arab to Islamic empire. All right. So this was the information pertaining to the Zanj rebellion. Okay. <clears throat> so this touches on all the uprisings that took place, the successful slave revolts of Nat Turner, the Haitian revolution and the Zanj rebellion. 
So let's define uh, bond two going into uh, that region because you remember when we were going into the uh, the book, it talked about bond two, right? So we're going to go into now the definition from Merriam-Webster that goes into what exactly bond two is. So let's go ahead and read that definition. Bond to is a term of a family of Niger Congo languages spoken in Central and South Southern Africa. Uh, bond to definition number two, a member of any of the group of African peoples who speak bond to languages. Okay, so that was the area that was mentioned as far as what is called Bantu. So now we're gonna look at the definition of the Horn of Africa, because that was also mentioned in the book. So let's look at the definition of the Horn of Africa for those that are not familiar. The Horn of Africa, also known as the Somali Peninsula, is a large uh, peninsula in uh, Eastern Asia, located in the easternmost part of the African mainland, okay? It is the fourth largest peninsula in the world. It lies along the southern boundary of the Red Sea and extends hundreds of kilometers into Gadarfu Channel, the Gulf of Aden, and the Ethiopian Ocean, okay, or the Indian Ocean. It used to be called uh, uh, the uh, Ethiopian Ocean, um, and now they call it the Indian Ocean. All right, so that's going into the uh, definition of the Horn of Africa, which region and what area it, it uh, is and how it is described. And this is based on Wikipedia that we got this information, okay? So now the next portion we're gonna talk to you guys about briefly is the East African Israelites in the area called Zanji land. This kind of puts two and two together now where we're looking at historical research provided by Nasi, uh, nasiresearch.com, which touches on the East African Israelites of Zanjilan. Remember that term, Zanj? Now this is putting two and two together. So here's the quote from this uh, particular region. <clears throat> Let's talk about the Israelite presence in East Africa. Many people are becoming more aware of the presence of Israelites in Western African regions and their connection to the transatlantic slave trade of Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 through 68. But what about East Africa? We will find that the history of Israelites in East Africa is as rich as the area of the West African relatives. As we review the history of the presence of the Israelites in East Africa, we will discover that many Israelites entered into East Africa regions long before the Roman conquest of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Multiple waves of Israelite migrations into foreign lands and their vast populations have caused many to misidentify these Israelites as Hamitic, okay? So a lot of times, in other words, a lot of times they refer to these Black Jews or these Black Israelites as Ham or Canaan, right? When they were mixing with the indigenous populations. So there's confusion because many people think that these people that they call Black originated from the continent of Africa only and from the bloodline of Ham, when in reality, these people are from the bloodline of Shem. They're a Shemitic people, which is um, interesting of note because many nations are Shemitic. The Arabs, they come from Ishmael. They're Shemitic. The Europeans, they come from Edom. That's a son of Jacob, who was a son of Abraham. They're Shemitic. And then the Blacks, they come from Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons, and these 12 sons are the ancestors or the forefathers of the Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and the Blacks that were taken in the diaspora. So in this particular article, we will attempt to prove some information and history on a few different Israelite migrations into East Africa, as well as some information on both how and when they arrived. We will also briefly cover some of the uh, more distant countries that the Israelites traveled to after reaching East Africa, East Africa. All this information will be provided in an attempt to demonstrate the historical validity of biblical fact, 
that the Israelite bloodline has been scattered into every kingdom on earth. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 4. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he he did in Jerusalem. So this is proving the Bible to be a true book. The Israelites were taken all the way from uh, Madagascar, the Horn of Africa, Arabia, Persia, India, China, uh, the farthest regions of the Philippines, and all these areas during the East African, East Indian slave trade. So these are the definitions of Bantu, from Merriam-Webster, the definition of the Horn of Africa, and briefly the Eastern African slave trade. So this con concludes our presentation on the East African slave trade. I really hope you learned a lot. I know this is a, a lot of information to, to, to digest, but I truly sincerely hope this can um, help and enlighten us to talk about Black history that they don't talk about in school. So this is part two of Black history that they don't talk about in school. We touched on the East African slave trade. I appreciate all the listeners, and I pray that the Most High blesses you with this information. And for those of you Blacks that are involved in Islam, modern Christianity, modern Judaism, get out of these religions. They never taught you that you were the Israelites of the Bible. You Arabs that enslaved us, thank you Thank you so much for keeping documented information so we could prove the Bible to be a true book. You Europeans that enslaved us, thank you so much for leaving documented information for us to prove that we are the children of the Bible, God's chosen people, and we're not going to uh, be upset with you guys. You did what you had to do. You did what was commanded of you through prophecy of the Bible, because our ancestors were disobedient to our forefather and broke the covenant of our ancestors on Mount Sinai with Moses. So because of this now, we know that slavery existed not only in West Africa going to the Americas, but now also in East Africa. Most High in Christ, blessed to the chosen people. May this information enlighten you. Share this with your children. Don't be ignorant. Don't be foolish. Study, pray, apply the scriptures. And now that you know this information, repent of your sins. Believe in the Messiah to save you from your sins and save you from all that hate us on the earth. Thank you for listening and peace and blessings to you all. You are now listening to The Forefront Radio, where we discuss history, the Bible, the history of the Israelites, science, and other matters. Bring it out. The history of the Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, as it relates to the Bible. Who were you prior to slavery? Who were you prior to colonization? These answers and more can be seen and heard as you listen to The Forefront Radio.